Max, thank you very much for organizing that. It's a honor to have you and the, Glorad, the other Glorad members with us. Have a great panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Moacir. Thank you, Moacir. Uh, and I will start by sharing my screen, uh, if you don't mind, a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it'll just take a couple of minutes, and you should be able to see it by now. Um, so I think uh, we have started. So we'll be moving on uh, with that. And I wanted to invite everybody to this uh, panel on global innovation and industry uh, 4.0. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Sao Paulo. Welcome to the world, quite literally, um, since this is being a, a global uh, global innovation panel. And in fact, it's, a, it's also a GLORAD panel. And I will uh, say a few words about GLORAD in just a minute. Uh, my name is uh, Max von Zedwitz, and I'm a professor at Copenhagen Business School. And previously, I was a colleague, uh, and to, uh, still am a colleague, in fact, to uh, uh, Monica Petraita, who's at Kaunas uh, University of Technology. Um, and one thing that um, unites all of us is that we're also members uh, of GLORAD, the Center for Global R&D and Innovation, uh, which is a uh, little uh, center that I founded uh, um, some 15 years ago. A quick introduction to everybody uh, up first. Um, so uh, I will actually uh, start speaking uh, more in detail about some aspects of global innovation. Um, I would like then to uh, pass on to Monica, uh, Monica Petraita, Professor at Kaunas University of Technology, uh, who will share some of her insights uh, and some of her recent publications um, on uh, global innovation issues. Marina Donc, who's a, a professor at Schema in France, uh, with whom I've worked on a number of different topics, especially reverse innovation. Uh, then uh, Thiago, Thiago Vacchino, a professor at ESEG in uh, Paris, who is one of the experts on incubation entrepreneurship, uh, and it fits perfectly into uh, the global innovation context because that's what's currently driving innovation globally. And uh, then Simone Corsi, a, uh, a lecturer at the University of Loughborough in England, uh, again, with whom I've worked on reverse innovation for approximately 10 years now or so. Um, uh, one of the highlights of our work was a uh, best paper uh, in the Journal of Product Innovation Management, which um, uh, perhaps is more familiar to the um, academic scholars among you. And last but not least, uh, Yekaterina Weinberg, uh, with whom uh, I've been working in Russia about entrepreneurship innovation in Russia, and she has recently joined Sperbank and is head of a research center on uh, digital trends. And uh, she will be sharing some of uh, her insights from Russia as well. She will be joining us uh, soon because she uh, had another meeting at the same time. So uh, just a few words quickly about GLORAD and what is GLORAD, um, that network, that center that uh, um, we are part of. It's uh, 17 years old by now. We have um, uh, several locations, several teams worldwide. And one of these teams is actually here um, in Sao Paulo at USP. Uh, and Moasir is uh, leading that team, uh, contributing to uh, global innovation research, uh, research on fruit innovation, research on, on reverse innovation, and research on how companies, uh, small and large, uh, make innovation happen. Um, we cover all sorts of subjects as far as they are we are concerned to global innovation. It could be global incubation, corporate incubation, multinational firms, technology-based entrepreneurship within uh, large enterprises. And we obviously, as an academic or as, as a scientific network, we, uh, we tend to publish and we like publishing. Um, and we like to work with uh, um, industry in order to make sure that whatever we write up is actually meaningful and, uh, and relevant. Um, global innovation is a uh, big topic, but it's not the only topic uh, as far as uh, uh, the big mega trends are concerned. In fact, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, share briefly with you how global innovation and industry point for know uh, the, the topics of uh, our panel here actually relate to what is moving and shaking the world. We obviously have climate change, one of the uh, uh, most pervasive uh, problems or changes that is happening. It affects literally everybody on this planet, whether they want it or not. 
Um, and global innovation is trying to find solutions, and very often technology-based solutions for these problems that have been initially caused by the onset of industrialization um, some 200 years ago. It only became apparent what was happening in uh, more recent decades. One of the other big mega trends is uh, the rise of the emerging economies, uh, China and India in particular. And that's great news for global innovation because here we're adding uh, some 2.5 billion people and their brain power to uh, the creative output and input of innovation. Most of which so far we haven't even uh, uh, realized the, the potential of because uh, that's a relatively recent addition. It usually takes one to two decades before um, an input into innovation really becomes an output. Um, another transition that is taking place is uh, the fact that many of these societies, uh, definitely uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, in the United States, in Japan, but also increasingly uh, some of these emerging economies, especially China, are aging. The average age is uh, getting higher and higher, which means uh, we see a transition in labor and who's actually doing all the work. Um, and who we will expect to do all the work. And here I would like to make the, the explicit connection to Industry 4.0, because uh, this is all about uh, leveraging technologies and leveraging uh, digital technologies in particular. And much of what we used to be doing as humans in the future will be done by, by a machine or by machines or by algorithms, um, and which is part of uh, the digitalization trend, which I'm going to mention last year. Uh, but one other aspect in terms of transitions and societal transitions is urbanization, which uh, at the regional level is uh, relocation to cities, but at the global level is also a relocation. And it's a global relocation to, uh, to certain countries, to certain regions, to certain cities. So we see the movement of labor, capital, and, um, and I would really like to highlight that intelligence and talent to certain places. And that is exactly what we're talking about when it comes to globalization of innovation, um, very often also concentration of innovation in some of these, uh, some of these centers of intelligence and centers of, uh, of, uh, of, of technology. And last but not least, digitalization, um, which uh, for some of you may have started already in the 1980s and 1990s when you first uh, opened up a computer uh, but uh, in the meantime has gained in many different dimensions, uh, both in terms of the internet, which came to happen in the late 1990s, but also just in the entire movement of businesses and business models and interactions with customers. And most recently also uh, going upstream and upfront, the digitalization of products and the digitalization of product development and innovation. And that's happening at the global level as well. And increasingly what we're going to see is that the physical product is going to become a reflection of a digital project product and no longer the other way around how it used to be, but we tried hard to somehow find the digital representations of what really used to be a, a, a physical product in the first place. Um, so this is just a backdrop to what we're actually seeing and observing. And uh, uh, my colleagues uh, here uh, on the panel my colleagues like Laurat and I have been working hard to bring you data uh, that uh, we can map into a world map like this one, where we're looking at where is actually global innovation happening. And uh, this is the this is a sort of a map of all of the global R&D that is owned by American multinationals. And we have that information, obviously, for other um, countries or for other multinationals as well. But just to give you an idea, what are these urban centers that have been emerging over the last few years? Where has talent moved? Where has R&D moved to? Where do we expect some of this technology, some of these solutions to come from? And uh, good news is that one of these centers is in fact in Sao Paulo, uh, is here in Brazil. That's the Latin American hotspot uh, for global innovation uh, based on our database of more than 10,000 of these locations. Other hotspots are in, in Europe, are in Asia, uh, Japan, Shanghai, Beijing, Singapore, uh, Seoul. Um, and more, more will probably uh, emerging. Uh, we have another hotspot in Moscow, for instance. Uh, we have one in Israel. So these are, these are hotspots emerging, uh, contributing to global innovation and, and global R&D. And this, these are here just the American multinationals. Um, and I've picked the American multinationals because they represent approximately 37% 
of all the global input into uh, R&D. Uh, Germany represents about 15%. You see uh, the, the table on the top uh, right-hand corner, which means that uh, globally, uh, worldwide, um, about half of all the input in global R&D comes from only two countries, Germany and the United States. Um, and if you, uh, if you looked at just the top six country, it makes up about 80% of the global R&D. And I've listed here for convenience the top 11 countries, but you really only need the top 10 countries in order to get to approximately 90%. Um, so uh, while we do speak about global innovation and global R&D, uh, it is very much a business of relatively few countries, uh, or at least relatively uh, few multinationals from, uh, from these uh, countries. Um, so when I say relatively few multinationals, we're still talking several hundred here. The, the database consists of approximately 500 multinational firms. Um, but it's still a relatively small number, given that we are uh, looking at several hundred thousand multinational companies worldwide, and obviously several million companies uh, uh, of all sizes. So globalization of innovation, yes, uh, we see that it's no longer just uh, US and Europe uh, and perhaps Japan, we, we see this uh, getting much more dispersed and disseminated worldwide. On the other hand, we also see a greater concentration into certain uh, locations. And that's part of one of these mega trends in terms of urbanization. And what makes this all happen, what facilitates all of this is, yes, digitalization and the move towards uh, modern business models such as Industry 4.0. And with this, I uh, hope I have been able to uh, set the scene a bit for the various uh, uh, talks that we're going to hear today, the various points of view from the panelists. We're going to address uh, both global innovation and industry 4.0 uh, topics. And that is it. Um, I would like to uh, uh, have none of the uh, Q&As right away, but rather uh, go uh, to uh, uh, first the presentations or the speeches by the individual panelists. I would like to hand over to, uh, to Monica. Monica, who is joining us uh, from Kaunas, from Lithuania, uh, from the Kaunas University of Technology. Thank you, Max. So I'll, I'll move on sharing my screen. Please. As soon as you will stop um, yep. sharing I'm yours. Doing this right away. There you Thank go. You. Thank you, wonderful. Um, okay. Now, well, it's very strange. I have things that actually, one sec, it should be my, I should see my presentation on uh, the sharing option. Okay, excellent. Okay. Yep. Okay. So I hope you can see it too, just as I see. And thank you for passing to, to me. I think I'm, I'm uh, uh, before Moscow joins, I'm the most Eastern uh, part of the Glorad so far of the participants. So it's getting dark already. Um, so I'm joining uh, from Konas and as Max uh, briefly introduced, so here we have a Glorad uh, so-called Gloran Central Eastern Europe, we call it. So we focus on uh, our research and our efforts on understanding the economies in transition and especially focusing on, now we call it European peripheries. So everything that is outside of the core, industrial core of Europe. And um, so we'll look at the transition issues and transition challenges or integration challenges of uh, so-called latecomers economies into their uh, networks, industrial networks of, of Europe and innovation networks of Europe and the larger world. So um, I would like to present something that is ongoing here with us uh, uh, on the one of the core issues of technology upgrading and industrial integration is technology learning. Um, within international networks. And we are elaborating those ideas for a couple of years now on, on how technology learning and trust uh, uh, helps uh, firms from uh, European peripheries, in that case, the Baltic 
uh, countries to integrate into the uh, international innovation and production networks. And uh, we have developed that work, just uh, our group is expanding. So we hope uh, that uh, some of the publications are uh, forthcoming and some are already published in that issue, but uh, Max is also a part of this um, work that we are continuing for a couple of years now. So what is important that we look at the transition uh, of the economies uh, from their uh, perspective of innovation systems that uh, obviously uh, started together with, uh, uh, let's say, so the work of Giovanni Dozzi and Bank of Landwell, uh, which defines uh, uh, in the innovation systems of multiplied layers of interactions among, uh, among different actors uh, between a wide range of individuals and also of, uh, of institutions, firms, and organizations. So this is very important um, where we started and actually the questions that we uh, intuitively raised uh, asked based on their um, studies performed in Western economies is that technology learning and technology upgrading the core factor is learning within uh, technology learning within national innovation systems. So national rather than local or global uh, technology learning would be like uh, a core factor for uh, moving forward uh, with technology systems. So. However, Lithuanian economy, as well as other Central Eastern, Eastern European economies have demonstrated very high uh, levels of growth. They, they all represent the, the club of high income countries. Um, many of them rank between top 20, top 30 by the conditions of doing business. And another important issue is productivity levels raised significantly over the transition period. Uh, however, innovation remains at the moderate level in most of those countries. So that was important to understand how within the transition that's happening, uh, also the firms are joining innovation, uh, innovation ecosystems and how they combine their individual needs and individual learning um, uh, and technology upgrading issues with uh, coherent customer facing solutions across global networks. Because again, one of the core strategies of the firm is internationalization of innovation and any other type of, uh, let's say so international interaction as most of the economies are insufficient by size for any type of innovative uh, driven growth, especially as we face industry. And today, most of the Central Eastern European economies export around 80% of their industrial production. So it's a critically important to be in the international uh, network and be international player. So what we also looked, how those firms learn what we wanted to see, how the firms learn from their ecosystem partners. And uh, as looking at how learning occurs, we found that among the technology, uh, among other factors uh, like uh, uh, firms' capabilities, uh, absorptive capacity, and other um, constituents of technology upgrading, we found increasing importance of trust uh, that is combined institutional trust and interfirm trust uh, uh, for, uh, for technology learning uh, across networks. So what we uh, wanted to elaborate, so the role of trust uh, as combined with technology learning across different networks. So what we did, we actually developed some theoretical framework where we uh, firms innovate, innovation internalization strategy leads to learning and knowledge management for innovation as a critical need. And then firms naturally search for, uh, for networks uh, of, of knowledge and innovation where this uh, learning could occur. And um, eventually this leads to innovation uh, outputs uh, in terms of new products, new services, improved activities. Um, so we raised the hypothesis where uh, hypothesis uh, two is especially interesting for us 
uh, as based on theoretical observations, technological learning and trust primarily takes place within national innovation system and hypothesis three that international innovation networks um, mediate firms technology learning within national innovation systems. So those were the two important hypotheses that we wanted to test as based on the empirical data. And um, so we, we ran um, national wide survey in uh, uh, internet based survey mainly was uh, where we, we had uh, um, around um, 500 firms interviewed and then we looked, uh, uh, as I said already, into Lithuanian uh, economy data and we applied some PLS uh, modeling while using our software in that case uh, as a suitable method for modeling, um, uh, modeling latent relationships um, among, let's say, so small samples. And this is the result of our, of our work. Uh, so as we see our hypothesis to innovation development strategy and technology learning, uh, the, the direct links were very weak uh, within national innovation system. So we have very low significance or zero learning happening uh, between, uh, between um, the innovating firm as the direct effect of uh, of its interaction, I'm sorry, uh, um, between national innovation systems. However, uh, we found that uh, other connections were very important. So first of all, we find that global innovation system network is very strong mediator to national innovation system learning. In a way, you have to go abroad in order to become or to learn and uh, being productive uh, inside of the local, local in, in our case, national innovation system. We found also very strong mod mediator in international business networks and alliances that actually uh, helped uh, firms to, uh, to acquire technological no knowledge and to learn and then again move forward into into national innovation system networks. What we found very interesting that uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, international competitors and foreign lead users were important for technology learning uh, of firms. They didn't lead to interactions into the national innovation system network. So this is something that uh, we have to Monica, elaborate. Have one minute left. Sorry. Of course, I'm Just, finishing I, I this is the end. <laughs> and, uh, and what is also important that uh, we found that na uh, the technology learning and trust also an important moderator uh, me and me mediator for national is national narrow R&D network. That means R&D labs and um, lead users within uh, very local uh, innovation clusters are also important important mediators. So what is uh, still the, the core finding that for small economies, it seems to be more relevant to work in international networks and then come back and refine specific uh, knowledge and technology learning gained um, within international networks uh, already in collaboration with closed uh, R&D laboratories or or lead users uh, at home while uh, preparing, let's say, so better version of the innovation for uh, for for the internalization internationalization uh, of the firm's um, innovation efforts. So basically, those are the core findings: uh, full mediating effects of global networks in order to become productive within national innovation system that actually the, the, nation, the nation, the country is investing a lot and also European Commission is investing a lot. So thank you so much for your attention. There is much more in, 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 um, in our works. And um, so some of the others are also upcoming. Any questions or later, right? We have Q&A later. Questions, questions, we will collect questions uh, for later. So thank you very, very much, okay. Monica. And, thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll hand it over to uh, Marine. Yes, thank you very much, Max. I will share my screen right away. 
Okay. So can you see it? Yep. Yes. Good. Excellent. Good. Just we also see your next slide, but it's okay. Okay, so it's not supposed to do this because I'm not on the right one. So wait. Uh, uh -huh. Then just don't go into presentation mode and make the slides big. Wait. No, I, I know, I know why. Okay, now you can see only me. Yes. Oh. Okay, wait. Sorry about this. I have another idea. What? Okay, what about this? Well, there's some technological learning happening right now. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Well, upgrading, technology upgrading. <laughs> yeah. Now, if I do this, what can you see? Everything. We see your notes. We see also your notes, yes. I think it's okay. There are no okay, you know what? I'm just, because I have two screens. This is the reason why I have two screens. Yeah, just, just don't do the presentation mode. Just go show it from a regular PowerPoint. I have an issue. Uh, or shall we continue with Tiago then while Marine is trying to figure out how this works? Is that okay with you, Marine? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I will just swap places. So, uh, Tiago, well, can, can case... you help us out, please? <laughs> I will, I will. Hang on a little bit. Marine, I'm happy to uh, give you some pointers later on how to sort this out because I have the same issue all the time. <laughs> okay. So can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Perfectly, yeah. All right, nice. and does it move? It does move, it right? Moves. It does move it as moves. well, yeah. So that's awesome. All right, so thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you, Max. Uh, thank you, Moasir, my fellow panelists. It's always a pleasure to be part of uh, Cybiz and to be part, you know, back together with this uh, wonderful crowd, uh, crowd at Lorat. Um, as Max was saying, you know, it's a pity that we cannot all be together, but hopefully that will happen in the, um, in the coming future, very near future. Max, please uh, let me know how I'm, how I'm doing on time because I cannot see yep. you or any other screens now. I only see my presentation um, and that's about it. Uh, I'll wait for you in approximately on. seven, eight minutes. Okay, okay, excellent. So I decided to, um, to kind of, uh, you know, give you some thoughts and some reflections on one of my uh, research topics, which is entrepreneurship support. As Max mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're both, we both have in common that theme of uh, business incubation. And since I, you know, since my uh, early career as an academic that I tried to depart a little bit from that to a broader, uh, to have a broader scope. And that's, you know, why I, why I bring to you this theme of um, uh, entrepreneurship support. So uh, thank you in advance for your indulgence. These are not finished thoughts. This is not the product of any uh, academic uh, um, uh, paper as of now. These are just some reflections that are intended to basically trigger a conversation and, and have a lively Q&A about how entrepreneurship support should be or where it is moving already um, in the 21st century, right? So basically, just to get us on the same page, what do I mean by entrepreneurship support? Well, the three things that I put on this slide here. So basically, entrepreneurship support is the provision of resources to entrepreneurs, but also includes aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, basically, it's every uh, sort of uh, initiative that assists entrepreneurs, uh, aspiring and current entrepreneurs, to gestate, that is to undertake the activities they need to establish a company, also to, to found that company, so the, the event of uh, establishing a company, but also what happens later, so to grow and eventually achieve longer uh, uh, longevity, right? So basically, entrepreneurship support creates conditions that are conducive to entrepreneurship, okay? So I just wanted to get us on the, on the, same, on the same page here because we've all heard about incubators or venture capitalists or whatnot, but uh, uh, very, uh, very often you don't hear any kind of uh, umbrella definition for all this. 
and building a little bit on what Max said, and I won't go into a much detail here, but about the backdrop that we're being asked to, uh, to provide some reflections here. So basically, our current situation, and by that I mean, you know, whether it's called the fourth industrial revolution, which is kind of slowly brewing uh, in, the, um, in, in the last decade, decades, or more abrupt, more radical changes as we're living this year. I think, you know, it comes to the point that, you know, now at the end of 2020, basically you have a world that is increasingly digital. I guess one piece of evidence and one data point is the fact that we're having a virtual conference now and a virtual and a virtual gathering. Uh, many of us have probably experienced and experimented with, you know, teaching online and so on and so forth. And even if we had done that in the past a little bit before, certainly now we're doing it a little, a, a little more. Uh, but it's also a world that's increasingly transnational. And you see this also for business ecosystems, right? Business ecosystems and industries and, you know, even clusters, right? So like kind of break the regional or the geographical dimension now and are increasingly more global. Think about a simple example such as, you know, the App Store, right? The, you don't need to be in Silicon Valley to develop a particular app for, uh, for, for the Apple ecosystem, right? That's an example of a global ecosystem, right? Increasingly, and this is the and this is the part where 2020 reality kicks in. We're living in a low contact uh, economy, right? I mean, even a year ago, you would already call a cab by just using your phone and not actually talking to anybody. And now you can do that even more. At least the guys that bring food to my place don't even touch the food at the same time as I do. I mean, the bag of the food, right? There's no contact delivery that's being uh, deployed for everything, and especially now with a, with a global health crisis, it's even more um, it's 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 even more salient. So basically, this takes us into into uh, a situation, into a scenario in which entrepreneurship support, whatever it, ha it is, has to respond to these conditions, right? So entrepreneurship support initiatives have to leverage global ecosystems, not just the local ones, have also to kind of reduce the friction between the global flow of resources. And, you know, incubators famously do mediate this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, relationship between startups and the environment, right? And definitely, you know, smooth the national or regional differences, right? Try to tear down, you know, the, the walls that, um, that still exist in these, um, uh, 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 between different authorities, right? So to kind of shape uh, my, my thoughts here, I also, uh, I also present, you know, how I see uh, entrepreneurship support. Uh, basically, you know, entrepreneurship support uh, uh, um, uh, happens in three domains or alongside three main vectors. That is the institutional basically everything that shapes the environment for everybody, say, for instance, uh, one regulation, you know, a tax exemption and so on and so forth that works for, you know, all the startups uh, in all industries um, and, and at the same time. Uh, but there's also the organizational domain in which uh, basically you direct the resources or have a direct provision of resources to sponsor a selected startup. Think of incubators, for instance, that's probably the most uh, the most classical uh, example that resonates with everybody. And also on the yeah, other level- Just briefly to interrupt here, Professor, for you have about two minutes left. And secondly, okay. are you actually going through different slides? Because we still just see the top slide. Oh, that is weird. See, I knew something funny was happening. Uh, yes, I'm going through all the slides, but in any case, I, I'll share the presentation later. I'll just keep talking because I only have two minutes now. <laughs> okay. So there's three domains of entrepreneurship support, as I was saying, the institutional, organizational, and, and, uh, and uh, individual. And, you know, uh, since I only have two slides, let me focus on the one that I know uh, that, that I know more of and probably resonates with uh, with all of you, which is that of, inc of of incubation. So basically, one one thought that I have, one reflection that I have here for how uh, incubators should uh, behave, you know, against this backdrop, was basically to 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 emphasize much more their curation of resources. Uh, incubation, in, incubators usually work by lowering costs for startups, for also bridging uh, resources for incoming startups, and they do that with a very much uh, a regional basis uh, or a regional uh, um, uh, aspect. And, and basically, I think, you know, against this backdrop of global ecosystems, low contact economy, and so on and so forth, what's most important for a startup is basically a curation of resources that has a global scope. 
Um, what do I mean by curation? I mean, you know, the basic professional or more dedicated service that incubators can provide um, um, in highly concentrated industries and in, in, uh, in large metropolis. If you're being incubated in Sao Paulo or in Paris, you don't need a list of attorneys, you don't need a list of accountants because they're so abundant in the, uh, in the environment that you can probably find them yourself. What you need is curation. You need a professional service that can match you and your needs with that specific resource in the environment that you could not detect yourself. All right, that's what I mean by curation. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I ran out of time. <laughs> I'll make sure that my slides uh, are available. I had other thoughts and reflections on the individual level, how you should train entrepreneurs you know, against this backdrop and also about you know, some, uh, some Polish in initiatives, but I wanna be respectful of, uh, of our time constraints. Uh, thanks, Max. Thank you very much, Tiago. Um, and this is even more surprising because uh, we tested those slides before and for some reason now it doesn't work. <laughs> Even in the beginning, I was, I was, exactly. you know, the slides were moving and now apparently they are not. They look so great. Have... They look great too. Okay. So, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link because the slides are online. Oh, it moves. Oh, now well. it works. <laughs> well, I am terribly sorry. Um, that's how it goes. Uh, I will share the link because the slides are online. So you can actually live through and uh, hopefully seek some inspiration, find some inspiration yeah. for the Q&A yeah. as well. Okay, you, thank you, you make, very much. You make, you make all of us feel much better about our own technological <laughs> incapabilities. So uh, thank this you very is, much. Uh, this is not PowerPoint, by the way, but you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Back to you. Nareen, uh, yeah. how, does it, well, how does it look now? Good. You know, I was so not? happy to, yeah, yeah, I was so happy to have a lot of screens plugged to my computer this morning. And I thought, you know, I'm going to make bullet points so I, I keep up with time. So um, now, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. And yes, if I do, do this, how it works? Ah, uh, perfect. Haha, -ha. voila. Okay, um, so I will, keep, I will try to keep up with time, uh, Max, even though I have to improvise without my bullet points, but I, I'm gonna be fine. Uh, sorry about, uh, yeah, sorry about uh, missing the, the rendezvous. Uh, now we are here. So I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. I would like to uh, thank you all, but um, I would also like to thank you, Max, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. So. Um, uh, you know, so my name is Marin, so I'm a professor at the Schema Business School, also a member of uh, GLORAD. Uh, really happy to talk to you about uh, reverse uh, innovation. Um, so let's see if I can go through my slide. Does it work? Works well. Good, good. <laughs> okay, so today, yes, I would like to talk about reverse innovation, but um, more especially how this, you know, emerging market less developed market innovation strategy can uh, actually uh, help companies from what we call more advanced markets to renew their market shares in their original traditional, uh, we would say, home market. So let's uh, first define the concept because I, I'm not sure all the NGCs is, is uh, familiar with the concept. So a reverse innovation is basically any uh, innovation uh, that is first developed for and adopted in an emerging market before spreading to an advanced market. So here you can see on the slide uh, different companies that uh, we know of as um, doing uh, reverse innovation uh, these times. Okay, so um, if we think about reverse innovation in terms of the Vernon's product life cycle, and here I, I sit your, your paper, Max and, and Simone, um, you know, this is what we used to have. So, so the first picture that you see here, the first figure that you see here, this is what we used to have, you know, the traditional innovation transfer trajectory. So innovations basically are designed for advanced market and are then usually transferred to other advanced markets, sometimes at the end of the product life cycle, when the production costs are decreasing enough, so the product can be sold at a lower price, or uh, even sometimes, you know, when the, when the product is uh, outdated. Companies think about sending it in emerging markets where consumers have less purchasing power. Now, um, in the case of reverse innovation, the rationale is uh, a little bit different here as multinational companies innovate first for the emerging markets. So why do they do this? Uh, because of the growing middle class over there. So for example, in China, the middle class today represents more than 300 sorry, million of people 
which almost equals the entire population of the US. So not only do these markets represent a huge opportunity for multinational companies all over the world, but traditional multinational companies cannot ignore them if they want to uh, basically survive in tomorrow's uh, worldwide uh, market. Filled, by the way, by a lot of new companies born within these uh, emerging markets. So uh, now, really quickly, let me give you two famous examples, reverse innovation, maybe you, you, you know those examples. Um, the Logan is the first one. So the Logan from the, the French company, uh, Renault, uh, this car was designed specifically for price sensitive Eastern European customers. So launched in Romania in 2004, the Logan cost only 6,500, something like this, dollars, and offered characteristics responded to specific Romanian demands. So they, the car has a large trunk space, they, the car has um, a high ground clearance and, and great reliability, this kind of thing. So two years later, Renault decided to introduce the Logan in France. Uh, so in Romania, the Logan was uh, kind of, um, I would say, an affordable uh, car uh, targeted at customer who would otherwise buy a lower performance uh, uh, second-hand car. And then in Western Europe, when they introduced the car, the target market was new customers unfamiliar with the Renault brand. And that's important. That point is important. The people buying this car were not used to, to buy uh, from, from Renault before. Um, so these people who would buy this car because of its uh, basically performance uh, cost ratio, you know, so it was a completely new market for Renault in, in France, especially. Uh, now, the second example is the um, uh, electrocardiograph machine from General Electric. So this, this one is uh, really well known, uh, probably the most famous uh, reverse innovation example. And uh, so it's uh, in 2007, I think, so GE developed uh, this easy to use autonomous and transportable ECG machine for basically uh, rural areas in India, but also in China, I think. So in addition to being, you know, 20 times less expensive than the existing ECG machine, uh, this uh, new version actually uh, could be uh, transported easily, uh, work in remote uh, rural areas, as we said, where roads uh, or let's say uh, electricity, you know, uh, energy sources were uh, lacking. So in the second time, General Electric decided to uh, investigate uh, its potential in advanced market, especially in the US first, uh, because customers in advanced market were used to very high standard in healthcare. Uh, you know, the, the, this good enough product developed for uh, General Electric, for, by General Electric for India, sorry, uh, was, was not fitting. However, when you think about emergency rooms or ambulances, it was like a great uh, new solution for this kind of uh, situation. So if you arrive in a car accident, for example, if, you, if there is a car accident, then you can use this machine on site and have a first, uh, first diagnose the patient before they can go uh, basically to the hospitals. Okay, so now, and this is my last uh, slide, Max. Um, I could have been chosen, you know, to talk about my new... Uh, recent papers, but uh, because of, of the, the time constraints, I want to, uh, I decided to uh, test some ideas with you guys here. So um, basically here, we see reverse innovation as a learning process, or how we like to put it, you know, um, how to send your products out for graduation. So basically what we are claiming here is the fact that innovating for emerging markets, which are characterized by, by very strong constraints that multinational companies from advanced market are not used to deal with, actually allows for unlocking unexpected market shares in the company's traditional home market. So uh, what we are saying basically is that without this kind of external process, the company would never be able to come up with the same innovations and acquire this, the, the new market shares that it is able to acquire using the reverse innovation process. So it goes like this. What most multinational companies from advanced market are used to do is to make sure that they keep their incumbent positions, that they are able to you know, compete well on their market, uh, to do more technology-driven innovation, or I should say like this, or even sometimes more incremental uh, innovation. So you can think about, for example, the iPhone. The iPhone is a good example. When you think about it, you know, they, they made the iPhone 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't know. The last one is the XR, I think, or, or iPhone 200 something, whatever. 
So this kind of competition strategy, you know, and um, what we know is that today it's not so easy for companies to keep up with this incremental innovation strategy, especially with the emergence of tons of new products from smart innovators, often coming from the emerging markets, by the way. I'm thinking about uh, right now, you know, the, this uh, new phone from uh, Xiaomi. Uh, they call it the MI90 Pro something. And, and when you look at comparison on the web, you realize that they all of the comparison, they, they, the, the conclusion is that the phone from Xiaomi is better than the iPhone on every level, uh, almost every level. So now what they can do. So instead of, you know, doing this traditional, going this traditional way, they go through the emerging market. So it's more a customer driven innovation. Why? Because then here I'm referring to the literature. When you think about Dougherty or uh, even Daniels, you know, they have these technological competencies already. There is almost nothing new with the technology. If you think about the Logan, we, we had car before. If you think about uh, the, the, the ECG, we, we had this, this technology before. What is new basically is what we call the customer competencies. It's, not, it's more about uh, you know, customer-driven innovation or sometimes we call it also market-driven innovation. But it's not, uh, it's not all. There is also this opportunity with the emerging market because the emerging market is, you know, a, a big one. So in that sense, you take lower risk going in, going, trying your product, making sure that they, they fit, you know, uh, in a certain way in this market, because you can scale up easily in these kind of things. Then what it results in, you know, this uh, major technological competences with these new uh, customer competencies, when you bring back these products in your traditional market, then you create new niche markets. And sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes this is potential disruptive solutions for your traditional market. So to conclude, what we're claiming here is that more than a kind of a secondary strategy, you know, where you end up sending your products from the emerging market to the invest market as a coincidental action, you know, let's innovate for the emerging markets and then huh, sometimes we can bring back this in the advanced market. We say that reverse innovation is actually a strategy that you should adopt not only for the emerging markets, but also to increase your competitive advantage in, in your uh, primary traditional advanced markets in that sense. And this is the way to unlock new, uh, new markets. And the thing is, you have to remember that without this, this process, without going through this constrained market, and this is the key here, why do you innovate like this? Because emerging markets have really high constraints. So it's all about the price constraints, the infrastructure constraints, all of this. And because of this, then you have this, what we call, we call sorry, the boomerang effect. So it goes over there, but then it goes back even better. And, and you have this opening for the new uh, market shares in your traditional market. Okay, I'm done now. Thank you. I hope I, hope I keep up with time, Max. Thank you very much, Marine. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, very good. Thank you for keeping it uh, brief and to the point as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, as a reminder for everybody, we do have the Q&A at the end. Um, I'll be handing it over now to uh, Simone. Yes, right. So let me share my screen and hopefully everything will be all right. You know what, Simone, at least uh, you don't have the burden anymore to define reverse innovation. So hopefully you will have more time. <laughs> That, that was my second point. You know, I, I, I had to adjust slides on the fly as you were speaking. Um, so it's very likely that I have uh, messed up something. Okay. Let me see. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Yep. Okay, perfect. I have my own timer, Max. Uh, but please do use yours. Um, so I'll start um, now. Uh, first of all, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those of you who are uh, well in the afternoon. And thank you, Max, for this kind invitation and being part of this of this panel. It's always great to, to, to catch up, and especially during these times, it's, it's, it's great to share some thoughts with, um, with colleagues. Um, so reflections on reverse innovation is it's a very challenging title and it's something that maybe an emeritus professor or someone with decades of research experience should uh, should should do 
Um, obviously, I'm not such a such a person. And in my defense, uh, Max suggested that title. I just went along with it. Um, but I'm very glad that that uh, that I had that opportunity. But also, um, as as Marine just said, uh, reverse innovation was defined in the year 2009, uh, which is when. I started more or less my PhD or when I started looking at reverse innovation. So in a way, I've been around as long as reverse innovation. That is my legitimation. Uh, anyway, as Marine pointed out, look at that. Uh, nice example, uh, probably the most famous one and probably the most famous definition of reverse innovation. Uh, I'm sure there's, there are people in the audience and in the panel that don't agree with that definition, one of them. Uh, but since uh, the, the, the term uh, was first coined, uh, a lot has been happening with regards to reverse innovation. And, we, and we'll look at that in a minute. I put down another example of reverse innovation as Marine was speaking. And I took an example of a company I worked with quite recently. Uh, and it's a London-based company it's called Luwot. And what they have is a waterless toilet that they have developed for the emerging world. So basically, uh, poor countries that have not had uh, that, that, that were uh, markets that had not access to clean toilets and they no access to, um, to to clean water and to clean energy. And these waterless toilets, what it does is they, they, it's associated to a processing system based on anaerobic digestion and it basically produces energy, electricity from biogas. So it basically uh, produces energy from, from your poo. What is interesting about this is that it started out in, in African countries mostly and in developing countries, of course, uh, where the market size is huge, but margins are low and volumes are large. And we all know that. Um, and they were addressing a very specific problem, but they eventually found out that there was another market back home. Uh, markets, for example, where you have concerts when you need to have access to toilets. And we know how hard is that is access to toilets in, in festivals and events. Um, uh, so that's another example that I wanted to put forward of reverse innovation. But what reverse innovation is, is very much, as Marine already explained uh, very well, it's, it's, it's a concept of innovation that focuses on the geographic dimension of, of the innovation flows based on the dichotomy between emerging and advanced economy. Um, and, uh, and it's very much based on a, on, a, on, a, on a quite ethnocentric idea, which is uh, that global innovation somehow is a prerogative of, of the advanced world. And this has been perpetuating uh, since the uh, Vernon's international product life cycle uh, theory and academic literature has explored uh, why innovation was such a prerogative of the, of, of the advanced world and what are the implications of these for advanced multinational Later on, beginning of the year 2000, um, the emerging economies and the way we looked at emerging economies uh, slightly changed. Uh, they were not any longer just recipients of obsolete technology that was meant for advanced countries, but they were now recipients of uh, technology that was developed ad hoc for emerging countries. Um, we're here in the, in, the, in the field of, for example, Prahalad's seminar work on uh, uh, the innovation for the bottom of the pyramid. But what reverse innovation did is that it, it took it a step forward and basically took those innovations that were developed for the emerging world and realized that there was market potential also, also in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the advanced world for those same innovations. And that was 2009. As I said, since then, a lot has happened. Um, a consistent number of studies are published each year on reverse innovation or dealing with reverse innovation at some level. A few of them have tried, including the one that Marine cited and also Max cited, um, that we co-author, has tried to expand the definition of reverse innovation. But what I think more importantly we've tried to do is we try to frame uh, reverse innovation within the global innovation debate. So we try to find a a research stream home for reverse innovation. And Max and Marine have both worked on excellent extensive literature reviews of innovation. And I think what emerges from, and I would say I would like to build on those literature review and, and, and point out a few uh, shortcomings that I think, uh, that I think we, uh, we, we that, that 
we we uh, we have when approaching reverse innovation not only from from a research point of view but also as a as a as a as a general approach and mindset towards reverse innovation and, and i have them here and there are four quick reflections hopefully quick um, the first one um, is with regards to uh, the, the low cost point, uh, a point that Marine has done, but I, I would like to stress a different, a different element of this. Very often, as actually I would say too often, we, we refer to reverse innovation as, as low cost innovation. Um, we always associate it to uh, existing innovation concepts relating to emerging economies, such as frugal innovation, for example, innovation at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, of course, cost is a dimension, is an element uh, uh, of reverse innovation, but it's not exclusive to it. Uh, it's not exclusive to innovation for emerging economies or from emerging economies. And it's certainly a component, but the fact that we focus so much on cost probably drags the attention of scholars away from what's the real point, uh, what is interesting to me um, of reverse innovation, which is the, the geographic flows between advanced and emerging economies. The second point and linked to the first one is uh, the, the way we look at emerging economies um, is still very much uh, the same. I'm, I'm generalizing here, if you allow me. Uh, the fact that we look at emerging economies are fundamentally poor countries poor and technologically primitive countries. Uh, so we need to find easy, low cost solution for them. While this holds true for a lot of countries that in fact are not emerging, but they're just poor countries. Uh, it's not true for the actually emerging in the sense that growing economies, uh, countries like China, India, Brazil, um, many countries in Southeast Asia uh, that are characterized by what we would define a dual economy, uh, two words. Uh, on one side, yes, a rural, uh, poor, and technologically primitive area. But on the other side, an economy which is very much comparable to what we experience in the advanced world. And I think it's, this, it's the combination of these two uh, words, it's this duality that makes the study of reverse innovation particularly interesting. Third point that at least here is perpetuation of ethnocentrism. When we look at reverse innovation studies and at the literature that we have produced so far, we always find, we, we, have, we, we very often find the perspective of advanced multinational corporations. When we, we, we always have a lot of managerial implications and, and challenges and opportunities for advanced multinational corporations. But what about the emerging ones? Um, the, the emerging multinational corporations seems to be neglected when we talk about reverse innovation. And, and fourth and final point, uh, these emerging multinational corporations are in fact being studied extensively in a lot of research uh, areas in management, in international business, uh, even in innovation studies. The problem that I see is that uh, most of these bodies of study are not linked or connected to reverse innovation or the other way around. Reverse innovation does not connect to existing research streams um, and that makes it particularly diff makes it isolated, an isolated concept, and therefore particularly differ difficult to be studied and understood. So, in my opinion, our understanding of reverse innovation when it comes to managerial implication, for example, in terms of opportunities, but also uh, in terms of challenges, it always comes down to a few crucial points, which are common. Um, but in order to foster un our understanding uh, to the of the phenomenon, we have, to, we have to really try to embody reverse innovation within existing strong research streams and research theory. And uh, for example, we should, we should I, I often look at the example of what happened to open innovation and, and, and somehow I feel that reverse innovation should, should, should go towards the same direction. So we should look, for example, at reverse innovation in uh, university industry collaboration or in corporate entrepreneurship. Uh, we should look at reverse innovation in, uh, in policy uh, studies or in organizational studies or in social studies for that matter. Only by doing that, I think we can really um, further our understanding of reverse innovation and the phenomenon that is currently going on. And I think I'll stop here. I don't know how far have I gone. Yeah. No.
Thank you very much. I think that was a great, uh, great takeaway uh, for us to remember what we should be looking at. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Simone. Uh, uh, we have uh, our final panelist who has joined us as well, uh, Ekaterina Weinberg from Moscow. And uh, Kate, are you online? We can yes. You. Hello, everybody. I'm online. Hello. Yes. Great. Perfect. Hello from so, Snow, Russia. Yeah, uh, we can see the snow in the background already. <laughs> yeah, yes, it, it, it's it's not real, by the way. Just in case, I'm not freezing, but it's very likely like that outside. So almost true. Yeah, good. Um, Kate, um, we've already had uh, uh, five brief uh, viewpoints on on global innovation, and we'd love to hear yours as well. Thank you very much. Um, I need to uh, demonstrate my presentation. So just give me, give me a minute so I can show uh, my slides. Sorry, it's not, sorry. Okay. Uh, let's start once again. Sorry, because I have like many things open simultaneously. Probably one second. So, how much time do I have? Um, we have to conclude in approximately eleven minutes, and if possible, we can have a little bit of a Q and A still before that. Uh -huh. Okay, just one second. Uh, can you see it now? Yes. Eco okay. Health, financial stability. Yes, yes we can yes, see. Exactly. So, uh, what I want to start with, I, I um, no, not with this. So, um, it will be quite a light presentation. So, maybe it's the right point that I'm speaking at the end. So, I want to talk about two basic things about uh, big tech. So, how big tech companies uh, manage to uh, live through the COVID crisis and how they are doing now. And actually they are doing pretty well. And the and trends that uh, popped up uh, or strengthened during, during this period and how big tech leverages this trend because they are doing it again really well, maybe better than any other company in the particular industry. So uh, first of all, I want to say that um, during the first wave of COVID, which was on, um, on spring, um, statistics and research, research showed that uh, big tech companies earned um, from about five to 15% more than any other company during this period. I mean, the company who was able to actually earn instead of dying or uh, somehow keeping up with the financial balance. So, and it was a really good result and showed that um, um, going towards the um, toward being based on technology, digitizing, and actually turning into the uh, kind of a ambidextrous, in other words, uh, organization that, that has different streams in different markets. It's a good strategy to survive in such periods. So I wanted to start with um, uh, with uh, five. Uh, key words that can help uh, that can help you to um, uh, to that can help you to drive your business and uh, building on that uh, bring some innovative probably ideas uh, that you can earn or develop on. So first of all, of course, it's health. So everybody got really really concerned about health during the uh, COVID more than ever before, and uh, what we saw we saw that many um, like the market itself um, um, started to develop faster, and uh, a lot of new uh, interesting services appeared. So for instance, the most dynamic was the services that provided mental health, because uh, the crisis what was a lot not about being. Um, like being ill, or uh, but about um, you know keeping um, keeping somehow safe and keeping stable and somehow live through this uh, through this uncertain, very uncertain moment that was really unprecedented before. So health is important trigger to consider. Another one is financial stability. 
uh, again, the crisis showed that probably having one source of income is not enough to feel um, and to be financially stable. So again, what we saw, we saw arrays of different financial investment services um, that started to develop. And uh, we saw, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like three times more people started to do investments in March and April than before. So the market really grew and more people started to invest even like little money, like even a couple of dollars um, through different financial services that also started to appear and to provide different tariffs and uh, um, opportunities to people for, for people. Uh, third is definitely contactless activity. So um, uh, I think it's um, quite clear what is meant here, but it uh, gave um, it, it gave a good um, like boost um, to the development of uh, virtual assistant that I'll be speaking a bit later. Um, and again, something that can be contactless should be contactless in order to boost somehow your business and to make it safer. And uh, so the, the fourth word is exactly safety. And what we mean here that, that people and families start to think more about being safe and uh, uh, keeping safety instead of taking risk. And um, interestingly, um, now we are building our strategy, communication strategy of the whole uh, SBER group. So just um, a little remark. So SBER, which used to be SBER Bank, is uh, the biggest commercial bank in Russia and now turned in big tech. So we have about uh, 50 companies that um, we acquired or merged with us and also other our um, our own uh, devices that we just launched. Um, that's what uh, that's why I'm talking from the big tech position. So as a big tech, uh, we are now building communication strategy, new communication strategy. And uh, um, compared with past, when we were talking more about like unleashing your potential, you know, taking on opportunity, um, like taking risk. Um, now we include more messages built on safety in our communications just to um, like to, to make people um, to be to be um, some kind of support for people in this uh, period, uh, which looks more um, like a, a better fit for the situation in general. And uh, the last one is uh, communication. Uh, so again, what we saw that during the uh, first especially wave of uh, COVID, many people stuck in their uh, apartments, in their houses alone, especially in Europe. We saw this, um, uh, the statistics for Europe and what they felt, they felt lack, of course, of communication, first of all, and we are social creatures. We need to communicate. We need to talk. We need to share like emotional thoughts and so on. And what we saw, um, the uh, arrays of different um, services and not just services, but also options within services that enables us to feel um, like we are together. So um, it's no need to talk about Zoom, but uh, like other examples is ability to uh, watch um, move it together. So for instance, um, I, I, I'm not sure about Netflix, but like our service, uh, our company, Oka, and another competitors on our market, they launched an option to watch movie together, like to share emotions, to send each other stickers, like a virtual cinema, instead of going to a real one. And uh, we saw um, a, like a, a emergence of these options in uh, some other services too. So these are the five words that it's good to keep in mind while building, uh, you know, your, your business strategies. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, digital trends that really uh, leapfrogged again through the um, periods, through this crisis period. So first of all, almost everything um, turning into e-com. So every uh, single company, every single service um, started to think how they actually sell, sell how they can sell products uh, or services digitally um, instead of offline. Or even better, if you have like uh, like in China, I think they created this business model O2O, which uh, means 
online to offline, offline to online. Like this is the ideal business model that you should have. But so back to e-com, uh, for instance, Google Maps, for instance, um, they started to think um, and to launch um, services that enables you not just to browse Google Maps, but also to buy things uh, like to find places and to buy things from the app. Uh, like look at uh, social media. Now you can shop in Instagram, you can shop in TikTok, uh, like in, you can shop in other services. So every single, um, every single surface uh, where you can shop, like should be made shoppable because this is something that, uh, that uh, inevitably uh, bring you uh, money. Uh, secondly, it's live streaming, which is uh, a mechanic that was used um, significantly uh, during the uh, during the first wave. So it's uh, social, uh, not social, but a life life uh, trade, a life life commerce. In other words, it's the mechanic where um, blogger or you or somebody goes online and uh, somehow shows and demonstrate different products, different services. And um, again, this mechanic uh, um, started to develop uh, really significantly in China, even before uh, COVID. And uh, they have their famous uh, festival um that was on 11th of november uh, i can't remember how it's called but like it's a big big event where they sell huge uh, amount of uh, different products and earn uh, billions of dollars i think they earned uh, during the last one something like eight um yeah i think it was eight no, it was in UN, but $135 billion uh, dollars, uh, that was GMV of the event. Uh, and uh, during the crisis, um, other companies and Amazon, for example, picked up this mechanic and, and now they have the official program that enables bloggers to go um, live with using special um, uh, instruments built in the platform. Third is super up. So anything that can be uh, that can form super up will be super up. So for instance, we can see that food services, uh, different food services, uh, delivery of uh, uh, like raw products, uh, delivery of uh, already cooked food, uh, and uh, etc. Uh, now merging into one big super app where you can do anything you want. You can search for a restaurant, you can order, you can uh, uh, look for a recipe, you can order um, some special products and so on and so forth. You can see this in mobility. Kate, Kate sorry if I interrupt you here, but we're getting yeah. close to uh, the time. So if you could. Okay, okay, yeah, I'll be very So quick. we still have some time for Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, so you have two more minutes. Oh no. Well, Can you hear me? Yeah, it, well, it's 10.15 in Brazil, uh, which is technically when the panel is supposed to uh, close. Okay. So if you could just uh, okay. make the final point. So, uh, so, yeah, as an example, mobility super app. Every Again, anything that uh, brings you mobility will be in one app. Uh, delivery, which means that instead of people going to different places, now products and services go to people. So and now we see that Uber shows more revenue in uh, uh, bringing products to people and uh, orders instead of bringing people to places. Virtual assistance as an example of uh, contactless activity where you can order uh, using your voice and uh, more than 50% of um, operations uh, in the US has declared till the end of 2020 will be made by voice assistant. And you can do many other things with that. It's quite an interesting trend. And the last one is subscription. So companies started to roll out different types of sus subscription, which includes different um, all kind of services and you just subscribe once as Amazon Prime, we have our subscription now, Walmart, Apple has subscription now released in October and you can have different discounts uh, in a variety of services. So that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much for the time and uh, stay tuned. Thank you and everybody stay healthy.
Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Um, where we have had a couple of uh, PowerPoint challenges. Um, and I think this has all pushed us back a bit. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, here we are. And uh, we have uh, uh, several uh, participants in the audience. So we have six panelists and so we have a, a good dozen uh, participants in the audience. And uh, you have the option to either put your questions into the chat. And I hope you have the option also just to, you know, pretty much raise your hand and, and, uh, and voice your questions. Um, I'm turning over to, uh, to Moaz here. I'm turning over to, uh, to our hosts, uh, if they have collected any questions uh, from the audience at this point. Or maybe questions from uh, panelists just to kick it off. So Simone, for instance, uh, you mentioned there are a few challenges uh, that companies in reverse innovation typically have. And I think uh, uh, Marine was speaking about those as well. What are those challenges? I know, don't, don't keep them secret. Uh, no, I think Marine uh, has, uh, has, point, uh, has pointed out uh, few, uh, some of them. Uh, of course, uh, the most common ones, the risk of cannibalization of your own products uh, when you develop something for the emerging economies, which is based on uh, a low cost solution, and then you bring it back to your um, home markets, you might have the risk of cannibalizing your own product, uh, but also the risk of the, the so-called not invented here syndrome. So the headquarter of your own company as an advanced multinational corporation based in uh, the US, and you receive a product idea from your Chinese subsidiary, your immediate reaction would be, well, that, that is what the not invented here syndrome is. The immediate reaction would be to reject it because it's something that, that is so different from how you approach problems and, and you, would, uh, you would reject it. Uh, but also the, the, uh, how, do you, how do you ensure that your subsidiary has enough autonomy in order to pursue an innovation um, independently for the, local, for the local market and then make sure that that subsidiary is able to transfer the, 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 their knowledge to, to the headquarters. And these are for advanced multinational corporations. But what about the challenges, for example, of a Chinese social media company that have been, has been trying to penetrate the US market? Um, what are the challenges of TikTok uh, now operating in the, in the advanced world? And they're completely different. We're not talking yeah. about Invented it, that it, it's extremely different, but uh, somehow they're not in the same debate about reverse innovation as I think they should. Yeah. Actually, I think this will be a, a great comment for Kate to uh, uh, put input on because she's coming from Russia and uh, Sper Sperbank is from Russia. So in many ways, I think uh, innovations coming from, from Russia might feel some political or market backlash as well, like some of the Chinese companies do right now. How is Spare, how is Sparebank uh, uh, approaching these issues? So yeah, uh, we also face uh, this problem, uh, this challenge. So, but as, as a um, uh, big tech, we, for, first of all, we, we tackle our own market because uh, there, Sparebank is the only, well, it's not bank anymore, but <laughs> as, a, as a system, we have more than, um, more than 85, even more million of people who are users of our, like, just our financial app. And now we have the whole variety of uh, other services. And so it's, it's uh, like for us, it's um, quite a good market to develop on with our services so far. So we uh, don't tackle um, international market, but we have fund that invests in um, which is based on Silicon Valley, actually, that invests in um, uh, startups outside Russia, in Russia and outside Russia, too. And um, we do have some branches of our bank uh, that uh, in Europe, uh, for sure. And um, with our new strategy that is going to be that going to start very soon from uh, 2021, uh, we will have um, a, a, an international um, like direction and scope of work. Uh, well, we, we will see uh, what yeah. um, we, what it we will be, be like. Forward. Yeah, it won't be we'll easy, be but yeah. yeah, we are getting ready to that. 
Um, Monica, uh, you're a neighbor to Russia, obviously, and uh, I know uh, we've been working and you've actually presented on the issue of trust um, within Lithuania, but also the kind of trust that's being extended to, uh, to international partners. Uh, that was the point of your presentation. Um, how do you see trust uh, and the influence of trust in global innovation? Uh, you know, especially perhaps reverse innovation. Do we trust emerging market innovators? Not enough. Well, that's quite a broad question to answer. I think um, we have worked. Uh, maybe I will address it again from the point of research. Um, I think together with uh, Muhammad uh, Faraz, we, we have recently published the paper on digital trust um, for open innovation industry 4.0. And actually there we have a data that come from Malaysia, Indonesia. And actually we see that trust uh, is also important within uh, a digital, uh, digital innovation industry 4.0 um, issues and actually also affects positively uh, the development of open innovation in that case in digital networks. However, I don't think um, th there are two types of trust that we need to talk here. And one is institutional trust, which is critical. So I think for innovation and especially markets for innovation, this is critically important. Uh, while firms approach and select the partners. So I think the institutional stability is one of the core um, issues for selecting the partners. And um, another one, of course, it's uh, access to knowledge, including particular market knowledge and access to customers within those countries, where I think trust is like interpersonal, cognitive, and I think it's, it's quite different from institutional trust. Um, where we can have we can, we can have much more observations of uh, informal networks developing, and I think uh, especially being neighbor to Russia, knowing the Russian business uh, peculiarities a bit better from uh, investigating of Lithuanian exports into Russia. So normally it always goes through uh, uh, a partner subsidiary or some establishment within the country in order to overcome institutional uh, obstacles that countries put as the limiting factors in protection of their own markets. Now okay. talking about re reverse innovation, just very, very short remark. I don't think there is a, well, when you see economies, I think within each economy, we have a huge um, social divides and some economists, of course, in the North, they have, they are less socially divided. But when we, we come to the mainland, mainland Europe, I think all the economies have a huge social divides. Would, it be, would we take uh, Germany, Lithuania, um, France, the, 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 the roots are different, the causes are similar. So I think, uh, Reverse innovation has huge potential in Europe, enormous potential, especially as we are moving down into that regression yeah. uh, caused okay. by COVID. I, I, I have to agree, <laughs> but I also have to conclude, unfortunately, because uh, we have more participants from the next panel already knocking our doors here. Uh, so Tiago, I apologize. Uh, you made some great points about, uh, you know, how, this, how entrepreneurial support could fix all of these problems. And Marina, I'm sorry that uh, we didn't get back to you as well, but hopefully at least your topic was somewhat covered two or three times because we've raised the issues. Um, I would I'd like to invite everybody on the, in the audience uh, to reach out to, uh, to us. Uh, uh, and if you do not find us online, which would be uh, surprising, please contact Moasir um, and, uh, and direct your questions to him and he will pass it on to us. And uh, we would be very happy to answer any uh, open questions that you may still have. And hopefully see you all soon again um, in, the dis in the not too distant future in Sao Paulo. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists. Thank you very Thank much. You, to everyone. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you, you Marini, Tiago, Simone, Caterina, Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great Thank you panel. Great panel. Thank you very much.